There you are. Howdy. Happy Pride, Mr. Alfonso David. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. This is This Way Out, LGBTQ Radio Magazine's uh, virtual Pride event, um, a James Baldwin teach-in. And I'm so happy and honored to um, have you join us. Um, this is Alfonso David, and he is the president of the Human Rights Campaign. And I found you on Instagram reading one of James Baldwin po poems, and I said, I have to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> and not only find out more from you, but also share um, part of my career in preserving over 20 recordings of James Baldwin from public radio. So that's sort of where my integration with Baldwin is. And I, I discovered Baldwin in the radio archives. I never read him before that. So. Oh, wow. um, so our audience just heard a clip of James Baldwin speaking from September 25th, 1963. And this is a clip I shared with you. I um, mean, this was 10 days after the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, and the murder of four children. And just because this is the time, I think I better say the four children's names. Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley. Um, in hearing Baldwin speak only 10 days after that, and it was only uh, shortly after the March on Washington in August 28th, how do you feel it relates to your work, our work, and where we are in this place and time in the world? Um, as Jimmy says, um, it is the heart of the truth that is the fact uh, that our movement for liberation has not succeeded at this point. Um, we are still searching for that place where we can be treated equally. Um, I don't believe that any marginalized community in this country has achieved liberation. Not black people, not brown people, not LGBTQ people, not people with different abilities. None of us have achieved liberation in this country. And I think his words are still true today. If we really want to succeed, if we want to get to that place, that we call liberation and equality. Um, I believe we have to band across our differences to defeat what I think is a common threat. And that common threat is indifference, right? Many people think it's hate, but it's indifference. It's, I don't care what happens to you. So I'm going to entirely disregard your very existence when I take action to advance my community. And that is what we have to fight. We're still fighting for liberation as LGBTQ people, as people of color. And we have systems, systems of oppression that have existed for decades that dehumanize us. Um, and if we don't deconstruct this system, we will further subjugate ourselves. Um, I happen to be a black man, a gay man, and an immigrant. And so there are different systems that oppress me, that seek to dehumanize me. And we all have to be equally invested in deconstructing those systems in order for us to achieve equality. You know, I think you point, uh, marked on a point when I was listening to this speech earlier today um, and, and producing the news for This Way Out called News Wrap, um, where we have uh, President Joe Biden making one of a, a historic uh, pride um, message or statement, but also the laws in the states that are banning transgender children from playing sports to where there really is um, not a, a, a seam thread, but it, it's all up and down. And I really appreciate the work that you've done in, in your career and what the Human Rights Campaign is doing. In fact, I think we even quoted you in our news last week, Mr. Alfonso David. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, actually, I wanted to find out how James Baldwin came into your life and influenced you um, in, in your work. You know, as I said, I, I found him through the Pacific Archives and these recordings, so I heard his voice before I read him on the page. Um, but tell me about your story. James Baldwin came into my life um, through his writings and through his conversations. Uh, there is a book that was released a number of years ago called Conversations with James Baldwin. And it includes every single public conversation that he had with reporters, with colleagues, with friends, um, and it's published. And that is one of the most important sources 
uh, that I rely on when I think about James Baldwin. So for me, it was his writings and his conversations. Uh, I came into a uh, relationship with him. I, I did not hear his voice until much later in life. And hearing his voice bring those words alive made it an entirely different experience. Um, his words are powerful on the page, but when you add his voice to those words, uh, they go into another sphere. And he was such an incredible human being for telling the truth, for being willing to serve as an experiment, um, for being willing to use his life to challenge this country and how we see ourselves and how we fail to see others. Um, so for me, he has been such a guiding light in thinking about equality and liberation and how we get there. And in also forcing us to look in the mirror and be honest with ourselves. I often say that we all come to the table with different biases, implicit biases, uh, even some of the most informed and aware. And the challenge for us, I believe, is looking in that mirror being honest about the biases that we hold and rid ourselves of them through the hard work of awareness. You know, and, and a lot of times that awareness and that work that we do needs some foundations and some, something to look back on um, for inspiration, for motivation. Um, and James Baldwin's work certainly speaks to the the gay and lesbian rights movement, LGBTQ, IA+, and onward, um, as you said, all marginalized communities. You know, one thing too, that this collection of audio that we are um, offering as a gift for our donors for $100, this is a 14 hour collection of 20 recordings from public radio that I preserved. And in that book called Conversations with James Baldwin that I talked about, some of these recordings weren't preserved or discovered when that book was published. So mm -hmm. some of these recordings are actually additional um, to what has already been published. You can find some of them on the bootleg um, YouTube, but that's actually cool with me. That was the point, we wanna make it all heard. But one extraordinary recording that I always want to um, talk about is 1961. It's the first recording in this collection. And it's James Baldwin, Lorraine Hansberry, Langston mm -hmm. Hughes, a theater critic called Alfred Kazan, and another woman whose name escapes me, um, Emil <laughs> Capulia, um, another gentleman. And they talk for 90 minutes about writing black character and what it means. They really sort of center around Raisin in the Sun, but to literally be in the room audially with Jimmy and Langston and Lorraine talking with each other as family, almost like at a dinner table, is a masterclass in writing. Um, so I hope that um, I can share that with you and this collection with our listeners. Um, but it, as I, I was trying to get to a point to a question, honest Alfonso, um, <laughs> is that James Bolton's work, certainly from 1963 in during this period of the civil rights movement, the March on Washington, the um, bombing of Birmingham, 1968, um, with the assassination of Martin Luther King, uh, Malcolm X, uh, Medgar Evers, and on and on and on. Um, his work still seems to be universal, even though it's very specific in his message, the universality that it relates to LGBT communities and brown communities and immigrant communities is extraordinary. How does it, how do you think it matches with the HRC's work and um, that universality that you two um, indeed have? Well, I think at his core, James Baldwin is talking about humanity. I think James Baldwin is asking all of us to see our humanity and see the humanity of people sitting next to us. And for, for way too long in this country and other parts of the world, marginalized communities, people of color, LGBTQ people have been demonized and robbed of our opportunities to really thrive. We've had to fight at every single juncture 
to make sure that we can succeed in institutions and systems that have been created to intentionally oppress us. So Baldwin speaks to the concept of humanity, and he also speaks to the concept of liberation. The Human Rights Campaign is the largest LGBTQ civil rights organization in the United States and around the globe with the core mission of achieving equality for LGBTQ people. I see that as being a pathway to really achieving liberation. And when Baldwin talks about liberation, he talks about liberation through the lens of uniting across differences through an intersectional lens. Um, I don't believe that we can actually achieve liberation unless it is through an intersectional lens. I, as a Black man, cannot be free if I'm not also free as a gay man. And understanding that paradigm helps people to appreciate that my quest for liberation is inextricably linked to theirs and to this core fundamental principle of democracy. So we ostensibly live in a democracy. But we know that that concept of democracy is not universally held or experienced. It's very different depending on who you are. You're treated differently based on the color of your skin or your sexual orientation or your gender identity despite the constitution, despite the Bill of Rights, despite statutes and policies that suggest that we should all be treated equally. So taking these words and these principles and these concepts and bringing them to life in a real intersectional way is the only way that we're actually going to achieve liberation. And I believe that is how Baldwin's work speaks directly to the mission of the Human Rights Campaign. Thank you. Um, this is Alfonso David, the president of the Human Rights Campaign. I'm speaking um, about the mission of HR's uh, Human Rights Campaign, James Baldwin's work, where his space was the literary world and the stage of, of the politics of the day. This way out, um, our space, the International LGBTQ Radio Magazine, is in um, public radio, community radio space. Um, our partnered, um, you know, both of our organizations have that path to that equality. And I want to ask you about the power of media and the power that the space that This Way Out holds. You know, this is a radio station or radio show that's been produced for 33 years now by two people, two individuals um, that came up with the idea at the 1979 March on Washington when they realized media was skewed. And again, it excluded everybody, excluded LGBTQ people from even knowing how to work the equipment, never mind giving their voice. So there was a pathway to learning the media and being able. So here's a question. What would HRC, how, how powerful would it be if you had your own radio show on public radio? Um, and asking you for sort of a support, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if we had our own radio station, we could more effectively engage in the work of culture change. I believe that the media has a real responsibility, a legal and a moral responsibility to tell the truth, to make sure that we understand how people in positions of power and institutions of power um, can be and are being held accountable. And with our own media, I think we would have an opportunity to better and more expansively inform people about the reality that is the LGBTQ experience. We know that there are certain media outlets that misrepresent the facts, that attempt to rewrite history, that attempt to obfuscate the true nature of our oppression. And we have to rely on legitimate sources to represent the truth and actually speak truth to power and hold institutions accountable. So I am um, in debt of legitimate media sources 
that take their responsibility seriously because the news can become a reality for people even if it's fake. And so it's very important that we support legitimate media sources. It's important that we don't rewrite history and that if those, if we, if we see people rewriting history, we speak up because our experiences have been ignored, have been disregarded, have been in some cases mischaracterized for different goals. And most of those goals are really in an effort to effectively erase our contributions to society. You know, one of the, I'm going back to, thank you so much. I'm going back to um, James Baldwin, you know, coming up in this webcast, we are partnering with Get Lit Poets, which is a youth slam poetry foundation. Um, uh, Diane Luby Lane is the uh, founder, um, love them. And they were with us last year for our global queer read-in. Um, and they are also going to do a response poem um, to some of Baldwin's work. And it speaks to, um, again, not universality of subject matter, but um, generations, like mm. the elders know and want to speak about Baldwin. You know, I, I just had a great coffee with somebody and spoke for an hour with an 83 year old gentleman who taught me more about Baldwin. Um, and yet a 13 year old young queer poet can teach me more about Baldwin. <laughs> so I'm very excited that we're going to have a, a Get Lit Poet uh, as part of this. Um, and also being welcoming to the table in the queer community. Um, mm. So let me ask you, what would your first book be to recommend to a young queer person who's never read or um, heard Baldwin? That is not a fair question. Uncle <laughs> Alfonso, what should I read? <laughs> <laughs> that is not a fair question, but I would, I would say, uh, I would suggest two books. It's hard to pick one. I would say Giovanni's Room for a variety of reasons, including that it includes um, LGBTQ characters and talks about race and sexuality in very real, tangible ways um, that unfortunately we still confront today. And the second is uh, there's a collection of poems that was released uh, that James Baldwin wrote. Uh, they're so diverse, they're so interesting, and they give you some insight into Baldwin's work as a poet, um, in addition to his natural prose, which I think is beautiful as well. Great. Um, I'll take that, and um, we'll pass that on to all our listeners and um, throughout the world on our radio show. Um, you know, one of the, uh, you had mentioned Giovanni's and Giovanni's room, and in this uh, Baldwin collection, again, this is 14 hours of uh, Baldwin recordings that I preserved through the radio station, um, uh, Pacifica Radio. So these were recorded in WBAI in New York City, um, WPFW there in Washington, DC, where you are, um, KPFA in Berkeley, California, KPFK in Los Angeles, um, KPFT in Houston, uh, during the 1960s, all of 1961 to 1979 is the chronology of these recordings. Um, and there is a recording of James Baldwin reading the love scene from Giovanni's room um, mm -hmm. in a recording that he uh, partnered with William Styron. Um, so I'm excited about that. Uh, so we only have a few minutes left and I would love it if you would um, read one of your favorite pieces. If it's uh, the poem I heard you uh, read for National Poetry Month or if you have another piece you'd like to close us out with. Um, I wanna thank you, um, Mr. Alfonso David, president of the HRC for joining us here on This Way Out, James Baldwin Teach-In um, and supporting uh, This Way Out Radio. Absolutely. Um, I think I will read, I need to find it. I should have looked for this earlier. Um, let's see, okay. I'm going to read a poem that I love, and it's called Some Days. And um, it says, Some Days for Paula. And here it goes. Some days worry, some days glad. Some days more than make you mad. Some days, some days, more than shine. When you see what's coming on down the line. Some days you say, oh, not me, never. Some days you say, 
bless God forever. Some days you say, curse God and die. And the day comes when you wrestle with that lie. Some days tussle, some days groan. Some days don't even leave a bone. Some days you hassle all alone. I don't know, sister, what I'm saying, nor do no man, if he don't be praying. I don't know what love is the only answer and the, the tightrope lover, the only dancer. When the lover come off the rope today, the net which holds him is how we pray and not the God unknown, but to each other. And the falling mortal is our brother. Some days leave, some days grieve. Some days you almost don't believe. Some days believe you, some days don't. Some days believe you, some you won't. Some days worry, some days mad. Some days more than make you glad. Some days, some days more than shine. Witnesses coming on down the line. I had to mute myself just in case my cat meowed in the middle of your reading. <laughs> um, you know, uh, again, we've been talking for um, 20, 30 minutes with Alfonso David, the president of the HRC Human Rights Campaign about James Baldwin. And we've talked a lot about his political workings and um, civil rights work. But when you just read that, it really is back down to the language, such beautiful words, such fluidity and meaning and I moved every time I hear somebody new read it and I just want to thank you and I uh, appreciate you and I'm privileged and honored to have met you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Happy Pride. <laughs> Happy Pride. <laughs>